Good day, students. My name is Natalie Adams. I hope you can see me because um, it's in the evening in Pretoria, very humid Pretoria. So yes, um, I would just like to share my slides with you and then we can start the our week one recording. Just give me a minute. There we go. And then share. Yeah, so you can see me virtually. I actually love this virtual system. It works for me. And I hope you enjoy it too. I just feel that I'm part of the, the slides and not in the little box in the background. So I'm enjoying this quite a lot. Okay, so let me get started. So now this is a TFS 701. This is the T uh, first edition of language, SP students. So just remember that. So what we're going to do this week is going to be your principles of English teaching methodologies. Obviously, you need to know the, what is behind when we teach English. And that's what we, I'm going to focus on. So this is going to be your semester one, week one, Natalie Adams. Please do not forget my name because I'm going to be your lecturer. And yes, let's continue. So now we're going to look at what you need to know. What you need to know is this. My email address. Again, I mentioned it last week in the welcome and um, opening and welcome recording, but I thought I'll just mention it again for those who might not might not have had time to listen to that recording as yet. Um, you can find me on natalieA at stadio.ac.za. And remember what I said, people, learning should be fun. And that's my role as your lecturer, is to look at how you can include content within the the, sec, uh, the senior phase, first additional language classes, to how to make it fun so that you can actually have happy students. And that's all, the ultimate goal as a teacher. Um, I realized only when I was doing the recording that I did not put the recommend the recommended reading, which is van der Walt reading. I have it in the welcome opening and welcome um, recording. So please find it there. The three copies that you see here is actually the recommended reading. Now you obviously know that the recommended reading for this one would be your CAPS document that is given by the Department of Education. You have to follow it. So yeah, that's number one. So you that's the first one that you see. Well, that's why <laughs> I must get my bearings right when I'm trying to uh, show you something. So the first one will be the CAPS document. Um, yes, please. Just This is the intermediate phase one. Um, I need you to get the one for senior phase grade eight and nine. Okay, then we're also going to look at uh, the Ferreira book that we've been using for quite a number of years. These are all recommended readings. And then the last one would be Killen. And this is going to be also a recommend recommended reading. Your prescribed reading is the Van der Walt book. Okay, so just remember that you will find it in the uh, in your welcome and introduction uh, video. So week that round up things that we had to do. I told you that you last week you can do a, I just want to know how you're feeling, you know, so there's a task roundup. So introduction and welcome last week's uh, online um, lecture. I said to you, you must go to uh, your quick link, quick link one and then on Canvas and then you must tell me how you are feeling. I would love to know because as I've said, I'm sitting here. As you can see on my face, I'm fairly happy, uh, go lucky individual, <laughs> but I can't, I don't know how you're feeling. So please, if you can do that, I would truly appreciate it. So here is what you will see on your quick links one. It says it will show you um, activities. They will tell you to read maybe chapter one. You need to read page one to 10. Can you see that there on top? Then um, you will also, if, if you go look that way, let me get my face out of the way a little bit here. Just give me a minute. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So um, this is a task. Then um, you, you just need to worry at this moment about the menti.com one. How are you feeling? That's all I want to know so that I can perhaps give you a see what is happening to my students. Okay. 
Let's continue. Now, remember last week, I emphasized that we had three units for the semester, okay? So today we're going to focus on unit one, and that is going to be of teaching methodology. So what methods can you use to teach in the classroom? We're also going to be looking at interrogating CAPS, what the CAPS document says, and really looking at it in a lot more detail. Um, and so, so please bear with me with this one. So what we're going to focus on, number one, under this section will be principles of language learning and teaching. There are principles that you have to follow. We're going to look at the curriculum documents for home language and for first additional language student teachers teaching because it's it's sometimes it's almost similar. Okay. Then we're going to look at language teaching methodologies. And we're going to specifically look at this word, and I think last week I emphasized this word as well, communicative language teaching, CTL. You're going to hear this word quite a bit, so please keep that in mind. It will also, you will also hear it in your uh, assignment one, so never, don't forget that word. We're also going to look at lesson plan review for home language, as well as first additional language teaching. And then lastly, we're going to look at matching aims with access standards. Okay, so yeah, you can, and I, I, so yeah, I want you to go to Van der Walt and Evans. Remember, this is the prescribed textbook. And I want you to look at chapter one, okay, for now. And then I also want you to go to Ferreira and then look at page the numbers I've said to you. See chapters one and two of Ferreira and chap Van der Walt will, and Evans will be chapter one. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Okay, let's continue. So I firstly wanted to ask you, for those of you that's maybe in the teaching profession already, I know some of you are teachers or those who will become teachers one day. Uh, what kind of teacher are you? A very interesting question. What kind of teacher are you? Are you um, one of those teachers where the students, like the first picture here, on your left hand, top left, um, are you one of those teachers where your students look bored in the classroom? Um, or are you this grouchy woman with a, the, a ruler in her hand and she's just, you can see that she's one of those very disciplinarian type teachers. Are you this teacher here yeah, um, on the right hand side who smiles and her students look at her you know, why your teacher like this? Or, I mean, obviously, here we have the peanut um, comedy uh, cartoon. I'm not sure whether you are aware of this. Uh, I suppose it's my generation's type of cartoons. But are you the type of teacher where the students hear, wow, 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 but they're not really listening to you? So, and, I, and, and I've just summarized what an effective teacher, this is what Ferreira says. 2009, page four, okay? Ferreira says the following. He, um, uh, and he, he says that an effective language teacher is, firstly, warm and approachable with a sense of humor. Yes. I think it must be awful sitting in a classroom with a teacher that has no sense of humor. They are dry. Um, you, 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 it, it's so much fun to 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 be to just be able to be playful in the classroom i i believe so yes i think it's such a great quality to have so an effective language teacher is warm and approachable with a sense of humor okay number 2 it's also it's a normally consistent in in manner okay oh <laughs> i decided to switch the light on because, yeah, uh, yes, there we go. Because I thought it might be difficult for you to see me, but that's much better. So firstly, an effective language teacher is warm and approachable with a sense of humor. You have to be able to make fun of yourself even in the classroom. You need to listen. You need to have lessons cater for different learning styles. Uh, even when I was at a university, I would always say to my students, you know, some of you are more auditory, so you love listen, listening to a lecture. Some of you like writing and you like to listen. Some of you like visuals and, and so forth. So you can't just do the same thing over and over again. You need to understand the learning styles and be able to implement it. You also have to make your lessons that, that so that it's interesting to learners. 
from various cultural groups. I, I When I was doing my school-based learning last year, I read um, one of the students presented a poem on funerals, for example. The poem was about a funeral. And one of the things that I loved that she did, for example, in that lesson was that she, she asked the classroom, uh, okay, can you please explain to me how your, uh, your uh, a funeral is conducted in your class, in your culture? And I mean, it, prior knowledge, they had so much prior knowledge and they were so interested in this because it was almost like the teacher understood that I have a diverse group of students with a diverse cult with diverse cultural experiences. And because of that, I first need to give them a voice. And that is really what our teaching should be about. Okay. Now we go further. You know, need to know no students do not have the same economic resources. Very important. Some students might have more than others, but the awareness of that as a teacher is so important. You need to also be aware that there is a language diversity in classrooms. So some people might be have different um language practices. Some of them might be good in their English, others might be lacking in it. It's, it's all just you as a teacher being aware of it. And you'll find a lot of this information in Ferreira, page 200, uh, sorry, 2009 on page four. Okay, so identify your teaching style. I mean, it would be quite interesting if I was in a lecture room, I would have wanted to know what's your teaching style. Are you the type that sits there in front and then the students listen to you? Or are you a type that actually sits with the students and as they are asking, it's more learner-centered, you know, instead of it being teacher-centered. And that's what you want your classes to be like, especially language classrooms, because you want your students to communicate. So you need to create an environment where they will be communicating. Okay, so let's go to the next one. So this is week one outline. This is what we are going to do this week. We're going to firstly look, look at the CAPS learning outcome. So what does CAPS say? I mean, you can't plan anything without what CAPS says because we have to follow the structure of what the Department of Education says, the policy actually of what is what, what the Department of Education. So we're going to look at teach language using tech skills. That's not in isolation. That's one of the things that the CAPS says the outcome should be. So teaching language using text. Okay, so we can't have a sentence like we used to be, you know, today we're going to do concord, you know, your E's and your R's and your was and your was, and then you will say to them, write sentences. No, you cannot teach it. It cannot be isolated. It needs to be uh, text-based and so that they can see in if, how it's been done in a newspaper, an advertisement, a cartoon, in a book, etc. Okay, you need to also teach skills in an integrated manner. So you you cannot just have a, a, an exercise just on listening alone. You must try and do exercises where you can teach them about listening, reading, writing, and speaking. So teach skills in in, in an integrated manner. You need, we need to read and view text critically. Yes. Uh, obviously, we all a writer. When you get um, uh, uh, if you give your students a cartoon or anything like that, there's you need to you you can't just accept it. You know, you must you must allow your students to think critically about things. You need to mediate and scaffold learning. So, in other words, your students might not know something. Uh, when you start teaching it. So you're going to scaffold them, almost like give them, you know, when you see a building and you see people on a scaffold um, standing, especially those boulders or they're washing the windows and they, it's like scaffolding them, uh, almost like giving them a protective mechanism for them to start the teaching. So you need to mediate and scaffold learning. You need to teach independent learning strategies as well. So we'll go a little bit in more detail with that later on. It needs to be learner centered. It needs to be learner centered. I think that's such an important uh, quality. Because what we do we mean with learner centered? I'm going to go into a lot more detail with that. Because learner centered means that your students are actually going to do the talking, and not you doing the talking. They need to because that's how they're going to learn to deal with a 
uh, first the first additional language or were their home language they need it need to be learned and it, you need to use CRT approaches and that's again another buzz I, I told you text space is a buzzword that you need to be aware of when looking at your assignment uh, communicative language approaches is also some a buzzword when it comes to your assignment one so communicative language approaches very um so that means you're allowing your students to talk in the classroom okay and you need to assess formatively and continually okay so i'll do that I'll go into more detail with that later so here's your caps document i mean and you know by now what it says one of the things that caps says is that the main reading the reason the reason for reading literature in the classroom is to develop in learners a sensitivity to a special use of language that is more refined literary, figuratively, symbolic, and deeply meaning. Okay, it is an added method of revealing, reinforcing, and highlighting the ideas. So this is just one caption that we took from the CAPS document, okay? Another thing that I thought that was quite important here, and I'm just going to make my face smaller, <laughs> is to look, language is a tool for thought and communication. It is also a cultural and aesthetic means commonly shared among people, a, among a people to make better sense of the world they live in. Learning to use language effectively enables learners to acquire knowledge to express their identity, feelings, and ideas, um, to interact with others, and to manage their world. It, it also provides learning, learners with a rich, powerful, and deeply rooted set of image and ideas that can be used to make their world other than it is. It's beautiful. I, I, I have this belief that I always say language is power because once you can express yourself, it gives you the confidence. Your self-image becomes better. So just to continue what is being said about in the CAPS document, it further says it is through language that cultural diversity and social relations are expressed and constructed. It is through language that such construction can be altered, broadened, and refined. So it's a beautiful quote, quote that the CAPS document states, and that is what we want you as teachers to implement in your classes. Okay, now the national curriculum statements, I'm sure you might have heard about it. Um, they, they also have learning outcomes for languages, and this is what they have for grade R, from grade R to grade 9. So this is from SP included. Listening and speaking, so listening and speaking, reading and viewing, number two, writing and presentation, and then number four, these language structures and conventions. So these are the basic things that they they want you to, the outcomes that our learners need to have by the time they get to grade nine, okay? So what do they need? For, so what we've decided to do as lecturers is that we're going to focus during semester one, this semester, we're going to focus on listening and speaking. So we want you to, to know that we, when, listen, when we're talking about listening and speaking, we're talking about information and enjoyment for a range of contexts, okay? And so we also would like to look at reading and viewing so as well, and then information and enjoyment again. The next part, the second semester module, will focus on writing and presenting. So there will be factual and imaginative uh, uh, elements that we're going to bring in. And we are also going to focus on language structures and conventions. And this will be used how to use sound words and grammar and so forth. So you need to, your focus for the semester is going to be on listening and speaking and reading and viewing. Okay. Let me go to the next slide. Now, also what CAPS speaks about is that you need to know is that CAPS wants us to think critically. I mean, it's senseless as just teaching our students you know, okay, this is what a preposition is, or this is what anomatopoeia means, or figurative language, literal. We want you to think critically, you know, think, put the thinking cap on, and then think, 
think about things, reason about things. Okay, so that's another important factor that you need to take into consideration. So text-based approaches to teaching. This is now the one area we want you to focus on when it comes to the principles of language teaching. Number one, it needs to be text-based. It cannot be a lot of sentences on a wall that we normally have, you know, and then it's isolated sentences. No. Okay, we want it to be more involved. So what do we mean with text space? What types of media could you use in the classroom? Okay, so media would mean a lot of things. It can mean, um, it can mean, uh, for example, a newspaper. It can mean a Coke bottle. It can mean anything, cartoons that you could bring into. So that you need to teach languages via those text based principles. So the students, because... Ultimately, the way they're going to learn text-based principles is when they can apply it, when they actually going to read a book or see an advertisement or see a newspaper article, see a cartoon, that's how they're going to apply it. So one must be very careful not to uh, teach in isolation, okay? So what types of media could you use in your class, in your class, okay? Just give me a minute, students. I'll be back now now. Hi there, I'm back again. I just had to deal with something quickly, but I said, no, I'm not going to stop the recording because then I must start from scratch again. So yeah, apologies for me having to leave for a minute, okay? So what types of media could you use in your classroom? There's many of them. You can look at anything around you and use that as part of your classroom methodology, okay? What types of text could you use in the classroom? There's quite a lot of them. Okay, what visual material could you use in your language class? I mean, anything, anything that you see visually outside. And I mean, I'm going to give you a few examples of it. What is the structure, form, and the language feature, grammar and vocabulary of these media, these texts, these visual materials? Okay, and then what is the purpose and audience for each text selection? So these are the important methodologies that you, the sorry language, sorry language approaches that you need to apply. One of it that we are saying is that it must be text based. Okay, not isolated text based. So what do we mean with this? Text-based approaches, I mean, it's, yeah, we've given you a lot of uh, articles. You can look at, um, uh, a, for example, a Coke bottle. Want a personal, personalized bottle? Share a Coke with Josh, for example. You can take one of those texts and there can be an entire language teaching class around that. Okay, so there's one way of looking at, at it there. I mean, um, here we have, obviously, uh, a, a, an interesting um, political cartoon that you can also use for 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 your classroom, and I mean, obviously, they it says something. Yes, and uh, no, I know a lot of your students love so, so, uh, selfies, so that you can use that visual as well. And so there's a lot of these visuals that you can use. You can even go as so far as showing them and. Um, underwater bedroom. I'm not so sure if a lot of them will be able to identify with it, but it's interesting and fun, you know, so it's not like a lot of sentences that they're just seeing um, written on the board or on your computer screen. It's actually things that are interesting. They can look at the body language. They can look at what has been written on the text. So yes. So what types of media could you use in your classroom? Here we've given you a few examples. You can use print media. You can use books and magazines, newspapers. You can use a television, programming. I mean, use Netflix. A lot of the students might have Netflix. Some of them, if they have open view, take a pick of something on open view and then use that as a text to teach your, uh, something in your classes. You can teach, uh, uh, as I've said, preposition, concord. You can teach um, reported speech. Uh, it all depends. 
Okay, movies, for example, uh, you can use video games. These are things that our kids are interested in. Sell music. Oh, my goodness. You know, I think um, uh, one of the things that I had to learn that if you're going to be a high school teacher, you better make sure that you are up to date with the late, what young people are into. So cell phones. WhatsApp messages, those are all things that students are interested in, various kinds of software, the internet. Due to, so you are not teaching in isolation, you are actually having text so that the students can see what needs to be happened. You also need to look at number, so the one, number one is text-based um, teaching. And I've explained to you what I mean with text space. It's where you integrate all these different elements, visual elements, uh, newspapers, cartoons, uh, etc. The second one is to integrate language teaching. So what do we mean? So integrate, it's not isolated. So language teaching combines or integrated different learning outcomes. Normally we have, for example, a text like a poem me. Okay, so you use a poem me and you say, happy to be me, okay? Uh, black is my hair color, brown are my eyes. I am old <laughs> and just the right size. <laughs> my name is Natalie Adams. As, I, as you can see, I'm very happy to be me. Okay, so there you have given them a poem. How can, so, so, it, it's it's them about you teaching them about the uh, reading you're teaching them about alliteration which is part of a poem because here you see you can see you're teaching ah my eyes i'm years old i'm just the right size etc so there's lots of elements that you can bring into you can integrate it okay so how can following allos like allos would be your learning outcomes be integrated when teaching a poem Okay, so here you have your listening, you can reintegrate your speaking, you can integrate reading, you can integrate writing, and you can integrate language. Okay, so let's look at the next slide. So this is an example. For example, when you want to teach anomatopoeia, but you know, anomatopoeia is those words, squishy, uh, belch, gurgle, you know, those types of words, they buzz, bang. This is how you can bring it into the classroom, okay? There's so many ways of doing it. And um, so here you have bam, hum, comic, you can bring in poof, uh, zip, hiss. All of these elements you can bring in, okay? So here we have one, a Garfield, um, Anomatopoeia is a type of word that sounds like what it describes, boom, buzz, etc. Okay, so yeah, Garfield, I owe uh, a Garfield cartoon, I owe Odian apologies, and then uh, Garfield then pushes poor old, uh, um, poor Odie, and he crashes, so crash would be anomatopoeia. Now I owe him to, I mean, Garfield can be quite wicked when he wants to be, but it shows the students what anomatopoeia actually means instead of them just writing it on the board. Bring in cartoons, comic words, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so number one would be text space that we are looking at. Number two would have been we integrate different, we integrate uh, different language systems. So we integrate listening, reading, writing, a lot of things into our lesson teaching. Number three is that you become, we, we want our learners to become critical aware when using languages, their language. And then I want you to go check um, national curriculum statements for languages, what it means to engage critically. Okay, so what do we mean when we engage critically? We we want our learners to see how things have been written. Okay, we want them to challenge ideas. You know, they have their own perspectives about things. There's there's the, they they've got values and power relations. You know, we want them to express opinions on ethical issues and values. So, for example, all texts carry values which can be negative. Yes, I mean. 
people write things all the time and sometimes it can be negative. For example, you might have a text that sexist, racist, autocratic, judgmental, but that is what you want your learners to discover. Is this text actually negative or is it positive? Okay, so do it. Does it have words that are democratic? Fair? Is it caring? Is it compassionate? Do you get that? Okay, we sometimes find a lot of words that um that might be, as I've said, sexist. You know, um, I've I've, I've I had an a, a, an example where they would say chairman, but it should actually be chair because a chairman can also be a female, so it should be chair first person rather than chairman. So so yes, being allowing your students to be um inclusive, okay inclusive we don't want non-inclusive language because obviously that can create a lot of problems so how do i deal how do you identify these um uh, non-inclusive language what what values are being expressed in the text that you are reading how are these values being expressed okay so uh, what language is being used? Now, I'm sorry, you can't see this one here. We want you to, this is actually a person that's, as, I think it's a student that's standing in front of the University of Free State, uh, the, the gate. And as you can see, the gate's locked, but the University of Free State, the sign says, uh, University of Free, uh, Free State welcomes everyone. So I suppose in a way, the, the the visual that you see there is not very welcoming. So you can have a discussion with your students about looking at language um, uh, critically, you know, be allowing for critical awareness in language, okay? Um, and so forth. So let's go on. So number four, so we, we've done how many already? Three. So let me just recap. The first one is that we need to look at text-based um a text-based methods in your classroom. The second one is that you need to use, you integrate language skills. So in other words, when you're teaching um, something, try and integrate listening, reading, writing, and speaking skills. The, the, the previous one would be, we want your, our learners to be have a critical awareness. And in other words, be aware of non-inclusive language. Um, you know, negative language. So number four is where we're mediating learning. So scaffolding. Remember I told you earlier that, you know, guys working uh, on a construction site, obviously they need some sort of safety net and that's where the word scaffolding comes from. So where learning is supported and guided, learning is being mediated, okay? So you're supporting, it's mediating, almost like assisting. Okay, so how do you do that? You provide models, okay? You bring in an advertisement, for example. Okay, you're asking questions. How do you ask questions? You can say, um, how, um, how do you feel this morning? And you are letting the students answer. Okay, because that also then brings in your communicative language teaching where the, it's more learner-centered, the students are speaking. You're providing a criteria for what uh, is required. So that can maybe be your rubrics, you know, when you um, give them an assignment, you scaffold it, you're saying to them, this is exactly what I'm going to look for when I mark your test. You need to show him how to evaluate something. You need to find key points. Those are the, you scaffolding them, okay? You're making a list. You're telling yourself, make a list of this. And you also tell them to read instructions. So you can, once students can work independently, scaffolding can be taken away. But for mostly for grade eight and nines, especially first additional language students, they're going to require a bit of scaffolding. OK, so this is how it works. You first model or model the teacher, then you guide the teacher, mostly the teacher, then gradual, the teacher gradually release and then mostly student. And then afterwards, you will find that your students start learning independently and that will be all students. OK. We almost done. Yes. So number five will be strategies for learning. And what are these strategies for learning? Okay. So we talk here about speed reading. 
Okay, so this is what we where we're going to look at skimming and scanning and surveying because that's also an important way a student can learn. So it is being said that obviously when you read something on a screen, you you read slower than when you read an actual book. So essentially what they are saying when you read faster so for example 300 words per minute on a screen but but it will be 400 words per minute on a piece on a paper piece of paper the comprehension here it states will be about 80 percent and that will be considered to be a good reader so speed reading is a strategy that you can find that you must encourage your students to do okay so where will you find that you can actually go to this software here. We've given it to you. H um, HTTP, you will reading soft.com. You'll find this uh, obviously to, to do skimming and scanning, and etc. Then the next one using content pages, indexes, reference books, catalogs, keywords when searching for information. Those are all to do with skimming and scanning, but that obviously helps your students to become better readers. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, so there's reading complexities that um, I've just mentioned. Reading speed for adults, it should be 200 to 250 words a minute. For college students, they should read at least 300 words a minute. Okay, so we're expecting you from you as a college student to, to read. If you're reading um, from a screen, for example, it's 300 minutes, but if you're reading from per, per minute, uh, um, and then if it's for uh, if it's reading from a piece of paper, it will be 400 words per minute. So our speaking speed is normally about 160 words a minute. OK, but obviously, you know, when you speak, you also think. <laughs> and yeah, we, we think. So the, in our thinking, it's about uh, 1000 to 3000 words a minute, because, you know, while we are thinking or reading, uh, there's a lot of other things happening in our life. We start daydreaming, we start planning menus and argue with the speaker and so forth. But ideally, we want you as your learners, I think about between 200 and, 200 and 250 uh, uh, words per minute. But as a college student, we expect you to be 300 words for a screen, computer screen, but 400 words when you're actually reading something on paper. So reading complexity, discern different sounds of words, okay? Interpret, because there's a, there's, there's, there's a complexity when it comes to reading. Some words can sound can be spelled the same but then it sounds different okay so just be aware of those things they are different sounds of words um interpret various combination words like sounding out new or unfamiliar words that's how you know if, if you're not comfortable with a word please um, um get yourself comfortable first i I enjoy teaching English. That's all I've been doing my entire life at the high schools, at universities, in companies. But I'm telling you, as proficient as I think I am, I am will still find a word that I do not know how to pronounce. And then I normally go to YouTube and I punch right in the word and I normally say pronounce word. And I, it helped me tremendously. And I encourage especially... Um, when I do school-based learning, I encourage my this um, uh, postgraduate students. You, a lot of you might be doing it now, to actually, if you, especially when it comes to poetry, anomatopoeia, alliteration, um, figurative language, hyperbole. You know, those are quite complicated words, and it can create complexities. But there are solutions to it. You just go in. That's the way I do it. Uh, and it's been extremely helpful um, in my teaching journey, okay? Um, if, if students cannot associate sounds with letters, reading difficulties occur, and you must be aware of that, okay? So let's continue. You almost done? So a learner-centered, remember, number six is learner-centered. 
and communicative language teaching. So I told you this is also a word that you need to remember for your assignment one. And what does that mean? CTL is an approach to language teaching where conveying ideas and meaning is more important than accurate or correct use of the language. I mean, I've been doing this presentation and sometimes I, because I need to speak naturally, I find it very difficult uh, to read from the script the whole time. But I, even I, I, I make language mistakes, but that's not the issue as long as you can understand me because that is communicative language teaching. And how do we encourage that? We encourage that by allowing the learners to speak more often because the more they speak, the more confident they will become, the fewer mistakes they will make. So it's like almost the cycle that you have to go through, okay? So CLTL is again, is an approach to language teaching where conveying ideas and meaning is more important than accurate and correct use of language. Okay, so you get that. I've given you an example of the mistakes that I sometimes make, but as long as you understand what I am saying. So emphasizing using language for appropriate communication. That's the one that you need to, you need to emphasize using language for appropriate communication. You need to emphasize using language in various contexts as well, okay? So you also need to emphasize using language to perform different tasks and also for social interaction. So these are the activity types that you can use, you know? You can use information gap activities where there's information that's not there and they must figure out the information. Uh, by by looking at something different. They can look at jigsaw activities. These are just examples of learner-centered and communicative language teaching. You can also look at information gathering activities. Yes, so I'm going to give you an example about that. You can also look at information transfer activities, opinion sharing activities, and reading gap activities. So all these activities will allow your students to be more communicative in the classroom. In other words, they are now willing to speak in the target language, okay? So you can start by saying, for example, I'm so frustrated when, and you can ask your students then to answer. Because if you start out, it's almost like a bit of scaffolding that you're doing. You're starting out with, I'm giving them a, a uh, a cue. So I'm so frustrated to the wind, and then your learners will respond when I have to get up in the morning, or when I do. Another student can say when I don't understand what the teacher is saying. Another student can say when my mom, father shouts me without any reason. But the, it means that they are answering and they are being communicative in the classroom in the target language, okay? So here's another way you can look at it. Um, learners, uh, yeah, the sender, there's a section on top where the sender, you know, like students like sending messages, the sender will say, um, and there's a receiver. I can't now see this, but anyway, it's about a movie that starts and then you can give that communication to your students, okay? And then they can take the the the, the the conversation further. So these are just what we mean with learner-centered, where you give them activities where the learner actually participate in the activity. Okay. So learners, teachers must provide many opportunities for learners to practice uh, in the target language. We're almost done. Um, so formative and summative assessment. So formative and summative assessment, you know, is assessing at the end of, summative is assessing at the end of the course. So that will normally be your exams. This enable the drawing of conclusions about learners' knowledge, understanding, and skills, okay? Doing at the end of course has limited value as the information cannot be used to help learners learn anything more. So we encourage, yes, there must be summative assessments, but we also encourage formative assessment, okay? Because these are the assessments that you do throughout the year so that we you can see how uh, your, your learners are doing in a particular class, okay? 
So just be aware, formative assessments are important. So just to recap again, students, the TEFS, we put it all together because it's the same percentage. So for you, TEFS 701, uh, your SS1, I think I mentioned this last week. Oh my goodness, I forgot to change this, the dates, but it is the, the 9th of April, I believe. Your SS2 is also on a specific date, and then your SS3 is on a specific date. I'm so sorry. I forgot to uh, change the dates on this one. But anyway, you know that SS1 counts 30%, SS2 counts 35%, and then SS3 counts um, also 35%. That will give you 100%. The correct slide is actually in your welcome and introduction. Um, video but I will remember to just inform you when I do my next video for next week that you need to uh, understand when is the submission takes. Okay and yay this is what the last one I said what next um, what I taught stripes how to whistle I don't hear him whistling I said I taught him. I didn't say he learned it. And I mean, that's what we're trying to avoid. You you don't want to be one of those teachers where you are um, teaching them something and then they can, they hear about the listening, about the whistling, but they cannot actually whistle. So that's not going to be good. So for today, I've actually mentioned seven principles of language teaching. Um, I'm trying to remember all of them again so that you can just have a final recap. I think the first one is text-based learning. That's important. The second one is about you need to integrate all your teaching, your teaching. So don't have separate teachings for speaking, listening, uh, reading and writing. Have it all integrated. I think number three is that you need to be use non, uh, um, you need to use inclusive language. You need to avoid non-inclusive language. You need to also be, number four would be about critical uh, uh, readers. They must be able to think critically. Uh, I think number five is about um, scaffolding. So you must scaffold, uh, give them activities where you actually help them initially, and then eventually the learner will become independent. I think the next one would be your... Um, Goodness me, I'm now lost. Um, I think that we just go back to the next one. Um, numbers, learner centered. So, oh, oh, good. This is a big one. The CRT principles must be your. You you need to give your students opportunities to be communicative in the classroom. In other words, to um to practice the target language in the classroom. So there must be a lot of learner-centered teacher teaching, communicative teaching. And it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? Then the last one is about, yes, summative assessment is important. It's the end of the year assessment that's important, but formative assessment is also important. Okay, I am officially done. <laughs> And I think I'm quite happy that I'm done with this uh, recording because it actually takes a lot out of you. But yes, um, I, I will upload this recording for you. And I think there's a, a week one, a a online tracking um, online tracking quiz that you will have to do for me. But please go to week. Uh, uh, Quick links one, see what you need to do for me for week one. And so I'll see you next week. Okay, take care. I'll upload this as soon as possible. Thanks. Bye-bye.